Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the San Diego Cyber Center of Excellence, I'd like to welcome you uh, and all 300 of you, I might mention, San Diego business leaders to a very timely webinar titled The Great Reset, Geopolitical Risk and Global Strategies Amid Crisis, featuring John Satilides. Thank you, Qualcomm, for generously sponsoring the event and NAVWAR for partnering on the program. Please note, uh, we will be using Slido for questions, so go to slido.com, that's Slido is an S-L-I-D-O, dot com, and use hashtag CyberTalk for the event code to post questions for Q&A. There's no registration required. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Compton, who is the CISO at NAVWAR. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Ken, and good morning, everybody. NAVWAR is happy to support in honor of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're looking forward to John's insights on the global technology competition and broad spectrum of high stakes geopolitical challenges and changes occurring around the world. So now I'll turn it over to Jim uh, Skeen from uh, Lockton and San Diego Cyber Center of Excellence. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Ken and Mark, and good day to our audience. Um, John Sidalides is a geopolitical strategist at Trilogy Advisors in Washington, D.C and diplomacy consultant under contract to the U.S. Department of State since 2006, directing an advanced area studies program at the Foreign Service Institute, the department's professional development academy for senior U.S. foreign policy officers. He has testified before Congress and is a regular media commentator on national security and American politics, appearing on channels such as Bloomberg, CNN, Fox, one America and the BBC, as well as featured on Chinese, Russian, German, Greek, Turkish, Israeli, and Arab television. John's been cited in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Washington Times, Politico, NPR, and Institutional Investor, just to name a few uh, major media outlets. John holds a master's degree uh, in international affairs, specializing in international security policy from Columbia University. John, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us this morning. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jim, for that overly kind introduction. And let me first of all thank NAVWAR, Qualcomm, and the Cyber Center for Excellence for very kindly inviting me here to discuss some of the most difficult issues that we face as a nation and in conjunction with our partners around the world. Uh, very frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we title this The Great Reset, Geopolitical Risk and Global Strategies Amid Crisis, because we are candidly dealing with and confronting probably the most complex and dangerous geopolitical landscape this nation has faced in three decades, since the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, one stipulation before I proceed, if I might, the State Department is a client of my firm, but nothing that I say here today represents in any official capacity the position of the White House, the State Department, or the current administration, similar to the work that I had performed under the George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations, and now for President Donald Trump. So everything I say here today is in a purely personal, private, and individual capacity. There is a world of information to unpack, ladies and gentlemen, so why don't we get started right away here and concede that we are now 10 months deep into this COVID epidemic and the attendant lockdowns around the world that have devastated the American economy, the economies of so many of our allies and of developing countries around the world, and that has had such a massive and profound impact on our social and professional relationships, on our economic ties and our business ties, and certainly on diplomacy, on foreign affairs, and on national security. It often seems in the course of this pandemic and its lockdowns that we're enduring and living through a world that seems to be upside down. But our job as professionals, especially in the national security field, in policy planning and in business, and especially at the nexus of where all of these critical sectors come together, is to look at the world through cool-headed, dispassionate, and objective lenses to make the most sense of what is happening around the world and to craft the most effective strategies for dealing with these new challenges. First of all, we have good news in that it seems the economic uh, most devastating measures 
and effects of the pandemic are behind us. First, first of all, in China, which is where the virus emanated from in the city of Wuhan in the Hubei province in late 2019. And then uh, a local outbreak became a global pandemic in a matter of weeks through early 2020. We took our worst hit, it seems, economically in March and April. And like most of the world, we seem to be going through an upward trajectory economically and commercially and trade-wise, even as we continue to deal with the social and health impacts of the pandemic within respective societies. But the good news is that the trajectory going forward towards the end of 2020 and into 2021 is upward, and we are working together with our partners around the world to keep it moving in that upward forward trajectory. But I want to take us back for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, to the pre-COVID days. And here's a beautiful snapshot of the global economy around the end of 2019. The U.S. is the leading economic power in the world, trailed by China and a number of other important countries in the global economy, such as Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and a whole host of our allies and partners in the free world, in Asia, Europe, and in continents elsewhere around the world. And we have a, a trajectory now for China through uh, the pre-COVID era to potentially overtake the United States in terms of nominal GDP by the end of this decade, by 2030. We'll see now what the disruptive impacts of COVID have been, not only on the U.S. economy, but on China's economy, and not just data that may not be accurate right now or, or true, to be frank, uh, given the Chinese Communist Party's data communications to the world about its economy, but also what will be the impact of the world coming together in different ways to hold China accountable for the way in which it first concealed the virus and then the way in which it allowed it to spread for the first two months of the year. And much of China's explosive economic growth, ladies and gentlemen, has occurred over the last 20 years since the United States, in a bipartisan consensus, working with our allies in Europe and other parts of the free world, uh, believed it was best for China that was undergoing a quote-unquote peaceful rise in the 1980s and in the 1990s to become a member of the World Trade Organization in the expectation that a more wealthy, richer, and prosperous China would eventually adopt more democratic, consensual, uh, quote-unquote, uh, middle-class approaches to governance, to economic ties, and to become, as one Bush administration official put it in 2004, to become a responsible stakeholder in the international order. And so we see this phenomenal rise, especially in the first decade, uh, in the noughts, and then also in the second decade, with a little bit of a slowing in recent years, given the, the difficulty of maintaining those types of 10 to 12 or 15 percent growth rates on an annualized basis. But China has been the tremendous beneficiary of this goodwill of the United States and the free world to help its economic rise in the expectations that it would work as a good and, and constructive partner on the world stage. Now, China's uh, preeminence now in the global economy may be historically unprecedented in the last century and a half. But, ladies and gentlemen, this graphic is useful for understanding history prior to the recent century, where China was the world's largest economy for nearly 1,800 years, until the early 1800s. And what we had taking place was a confluence of major global events. In the 16th and 17th centuries, you had the rise of free market systems in the Netherlands and in Italian city-states. In the late 17th century, you had the beginning of a more consensual government with the British Parliament. And then, of course, in the late 1700s, the American Revolution, leading to national movements in Europe in the 1800s. And overlaying these capitalist and more democratic movements was the Industrial Revolution that together allowed for an explosion of productivity and wealth in Europe and then in the United States that relatively diminished the size of China's economy. And so China today is determined to restore its place, as it sees rightfully, atop the global economy today and in the years to come. And much of this is predicated on the what we call the liberal rules-based international order that was essentially launched uh, by the United States and the leading allied powers in the wake of the catastrophe of World War II in Europe and in Asia with the idea that no regional hegemon should be able to dominate any particular region of the world and lead any particular region into yet another catastrophic war. 
And much of the trade and commerce that would be used to bind countries together, to provide for a, a level of interconnectivity and interdependence that simply did not exist prior to World War II, would be based on sea-based commerce, given the fact that using this beautiful satellite photo of planet Earth, about 70 percent of the planet is oceans, waterways, and seas, ladies and gentlemen. And about 90 percent of the world's commerce moves on the world's oceans, waterways, and seas, as does about 80 percent of oil and natural gas. And to protect the shipping that is so critical here for international commerce, the U.S. Navy, working with our regional allies and partners all around the world, have protected and defended free and open shipping lanes, not only for the benefit of the American economy and those of our allies, but ironically for those of our adversaries and outright foes during the Cold War and even now in a post-Cold War era. So the one potential challenge that we face that is most grave currently is that of the, commun the Chinese Communist Party under the rise to power of General Secretary Xi Jinping. Now, General Secretary Xi, and I don't call him president because that confers an air of legitimacy, usually through a democratic process, that simply isn't the case in China. Uh, his seat of power is not uh, anything but the fact that he's general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. And we need to be mindful of this, and I'll elaborate further in this presentation. But uh, General Secretary Xi has gone beyond the rule of prior premiers in China that adopted a strategy of peaceful rise and biding China's time so that it would become a quote-unquote accepted member of the international community on a very gradual and non-threatening basis. Under General Secretary Xi since 2012, we've seen a Chinese policy towards the world that one might call ambitious, some might call aggressive, and others would call outright belligerent, if not hostile. And I will posit here, ladies and gentlemen, that the strategic axis around which China-U.S. relations revolve will really form the underpinnings for the manner in which global commerce and diplomacy proceed in the years and near decades to come. And I need to also emphasize the fact that General Secretary Xi, again, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, is ruling a, a party and uh, a country, for that fact, for that matter, that really does not operate as a normal country in the context of how this liberal rules-based international order has proceeded over the last 70 years. What we have here is a rigidly ideological Leninist party that has as its primary mission the national rejuvenation of China, back to its glory days pre-19th century, but through maintenance of absolute control over every critical aspect of governance and economic activity and military activity and social activity in China. And in fact, there are no independent government institutions in China. The party controls the government. The party controls the military. The party controls the economy. And we must be mindful of this in all of our dealings. This is not simply a larger market than Japan or than Germany. This is a country with a very different value system and a very different governance system, and then one that poses a direct and increasingly belligerent challenge to the rules-based international order that has provided the United States, our allies, and the free, and most of the developing world with a relative peace and prosperity that is literally unprecedented in human history. And with all the challenges that we'll be outlining in this presentation, ladies and gentlemen, let us never forget that we are so fortunate to be living in the greatest period of material quality of life and convenience and prosperity ever in human history. Even in the midst of this COVID pandemic, there's never been a greater time to be alive than in 2020. But we do face some very serious challenges that are posed by Chinese Communist Party rule. And I think it's, it's useful here to bring in a little bit of historical background, and that is that China had historically seen itself as the Middle Kingdom. That was the title it reserved for itself. And there's both a geopolitical and a metaphysical component to this. Uh, geopolitically, of course, it saw itself as the center tributary state among a number of inferior tribes and peoples in Asia that would pay tribute to the emperor of China in exchange for peace and for commerce. 
but also in a metaphysical sense that China was indeed the greatest empire in the world, located in a place above these inferior neighbors and below the heavens. And so this place of primacy that really escapes most of our understanding in the West is how the Chinese have historically thought of themselves, especially the Han majority, uh, throughout history, and now coupled this with a rigid Leninist philosophy and ideology to achieve global dominance through a number of means, which we'll now begin to outline. One of these is the Belt Road Initiative, ladies and gentlemen, which in some ways seems to be the most ambitious global infrastructure project ever devised. And in some, it may involve several hundred major infrastructure projects, the total investment from the Chinese government, Chinese banks, Chinese financial institutions, and Chinese state-owned enterprises could be as much as three, maybe four trillion dollars over the next decade. And it, this really is an amalgam of different infrastructure projects to provide an outlet for excess industrial uh, capacity and excess labor capacity in China, especially after the massive state debt that was uh, infused into the economy to deal with the 2008 financial crisis. So China has been exporting industrial and labor capacity to build major infrastructure projects in South Asia and Central Asia and the Middle East and Africa. And increasingly, we're concerned now in the United States, also in Latin America and in the Caribbean. But there are several troubling components to this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there is a component that we consider in Washington to be uh, quote unquote predatory lending or debt diplomacy, where the agreements to build these projects are cloaked in these very um, opaque agreements with very onerous repayment terms and where governments have not been able to repay the terms of the, the credit assistance, the credit uh, loans, uh, they have been uh, forced to either surrender sovereign assets, as happened in Sri Lanka, a geostrategically located island near the, uh, the nation of India, and also similar threats in a number of African countries that have forced those governments to revisit those agreements. And so China, dealing now with the diplomatic backlash from many uh, credit recipient countries has instead pursued a, a strategy of coercing these countries to mute their criticism of Chinese policies on the world stage at the UN and in international organizations, especially as it pertains to China's egregious human rights violations, more of which we'll talk about shortly, its violations of trade agreements and legal standards, and especially as it pertains to these particular projects, the enormous environmental devastation being wrought by Chinese companies in terms of uh, massive export of coal-fired plants that will continue to pollute the air and emit carbon for decades to come, and also the devastation to fragile ecosystems and river basins in many of these countries. So we're watching this particular strategy very closely. I don't know if it's quite as unified on the part of the Chinese government as it's been reported. And it may just be instead a grand strategy devised by General Secretary Xi to give the sense of cohesiveness to what's been a rather haphazard uh, strategy, or I shouldn't say strategy, but effective implementation of construction and infrastructure projects worldwide, and to put it into something that looks far more onerous than it may actually be. Now, there is one aspect to Belt Road Initiative that involves significant stakes, either majority or significant minority stakes, in more than a dozen critical European ports, including some of the leading ones in Antwerp, in Rotterdam, in Hamburg, in Piraeus, and in Valencia, and in the Mediterranean. And the issue here so much is not developing countries needing Chinese credit, of course. These are very wealthy and prosperous European Union countries. But really, uh, China's, by design, strategy to more greatly influence the global shipping economy and also something that, again, is very distinct given the Chinese Communist Party's rule in China, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the lack of a distinction, the way we have in the West, between civil authority and military authority. In the West, of course, civilians rule the government and military officers and institutions follow the orders of civilian authorities. In China, the Chinese Communist Party rules everything and they rule civilian institutions and military institutions. So they've undertaken a strategy of civil military fusion, and there are probably a large number of Chinese intelligence, military, and party operatives that either work at these ports and facilities in Europe, 
or are actively conducting surveillance and intelligence gathering operations of those European economies via these Chinese port companies. And this is especially valuable for the Chinese Communist Party when there are U.S. warships that are docking at or near these European ports. Now, similarly, but distinctively, China has also invested in dozens of ports in Africa, but not so much for civil military fusion purposes, but because so many African countries are extraordinarily rich in natural resources that China, for very understandable reasons, wants to maintain secure access to for its own economic growth prospects. So, A, you have this desire to have independent access, independent of the U.S.-led maritime supply chain that we detailed earlier uh, in these African countries, but also now, as I mentioned earlier with some of the BRI problems, to more effectively influence and coerce governments, and there are so many of them in Africa, it's a colossal continent, into which China, Europe, India, and the United States actually all fit geographically. Our map rendition sometimes poorly describe just how massive the continent is and how many countries are there to garner more votes in the United Nations and in international institutions, again, to protect China's reputation internationally, to mute criticism, and also to mute criticism within the respective countries, especially when scandals about BRI projects and, again, environmental devastation come to the foreground in media in these various nations. And this BRI strategy now also has a, a polar component to it, we, what we call the Polar Silk Road, ladies and gentlemen. And because the Arctic Ocean has been warming off of the uh, Russian coastline in the Arctic region, not so much off the coast of North America, that's mostly still ice locked, but you have passable waters off of Russia's Arctic frontier and within its territorial waters, so that you have smaller ships that can sail through these shallower waters anywhere from eight to 10, maybe 11 months out of the year. And this is expected to be the case for at least the next eight to 10 years, according to computer models. So China is now taking advantage of these shorter shipping lanes from its ports in Northeast uh, China to European destinations and even potentially to the Eastern seaboard of North America in ways that shave off 25 to 30 percent of the time. And this is especially important for time sensitive supply chain management, and also significant cost savings because you're paying shipping companies far less because they're at sea for far shorter periods. And they're working closely now with their junior partner, Russia, which has already begun a strategy of fortifying and upgrading about two dozen air and naval facilities all along the Arctic frontier to maintain better control over these territorial waters and to be able to extract valuable transit fees as more and more companies use this Arctic, quote unquote, northern sea route to connect East Asian markets with those in Europe and potentially in the eastern seaboard. So now let's shift over to China's perspective on the Pacific Ocean. Now, historically, ladies and gentlemen, China has been a land power. And the Han empires in mainland China have almost always been attacked by land from other parts of the Asian continent. Well, China has very effectively secured its land borders over the course of the last 80 years. And now it is looking to project power out into the Pacific Ocean. So this map here is uh, one that takes the north-south axis and turns it to the side so it's more on an east-west axis. And China is now able to look out towards the Pacific. And what does it find? It sees... Uh, the U.S. military presence there to defend these free and open shipping lanes, right? From a U.S. perspective, it's a very benign strategy that we've adopted and paid for through our tax dollars and implemented through the U.S. Navy and allied navies to provide free and open shipping for all of the countries in the region, including China, probably the single largest beneficiary of these U.S. protected sea lanes over the last 20 years. But to do so, we have 50,000 troops that are stationed in Japan uh, on a number of bases in the Japanese islands, about 28,000 U.S. troops based in South Korea, major arms sales to Taiwan, which China considers to be a rogue province, which, by the way, again, public domain sources. Uh, General Secretary Xi warned uh, Taiwan in January of 2019 that it will be unified with China by 2049 ideally voluntarily, and if not, through military means, and 2049 being a key objective because that's the centennial of the rise to power of the Chinese Communist Party in modern-day China. 
Uh, but then as we look across the map, we also see U.S. defense cooperation agreements with the Philippines, with Indonesia, ironically, even with Vietnam. On the horizon is the marine base of Guam, and beyond the horizon, of course, are the Hawaiian Islands, the 50th state. So uh, China sees an artificial, um, abnormal U.S. military presence that is constraining, unfairly, China's natural power projection to craft out for its own sphere of influence, and especially in the geostrategic Yellow Sea, East Asia Sea, and the South China Sea. And let's focus first on the South China Sea, ladies and gentlemen, because this is in many ways one of the most important waterways in the world. About one-third of the world's commerce annually traverses the South China Sea. And you also have uh, vast oil and natural gas shipments to lubricate the economies of China, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, all of which are inordinately dependent on Middle East energy supplies for their economic power. But the South China Sea also holds beneath the seabed perhaps 10 to 15 percent of the world's oil and natural gas reserves, and also vast fisheries to provide high-protein diets for increasingly affluent societies in Asia. So you have so many critical components of the South China Sea, but let me emphasize what is perhaps the most important from a U.S. perspective, and that is that it is 1.4 million square miles of international waterways and international airspace. And it's very important to maintain this legal administration of the South China Sea, ladies and gentlemen, because we don't want to see a situation where one country declares unilateral sovereignty over international waters, diminishes international shipping lanes and airspace travel in ways that could be very deleterious to the global economy. Unfortunately, China has been doing just this over the last 10 to 15 years. And you see here on this map what we call in Washington the cow's tongue, this very long red line that goes down about 1,000 miles south off of China's coastline and overlaps with the maritime boundaries of a number of countries that also border the South China Sea. And unfortunately, China has utterly ignored the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in terms of how countries are to amicably and peacefully come together to delineate their maritime claims and their exclusive economic zones. And China has unilaterally declared this entire region to be essentially a sovereign Chinese lake. And to make matters more difficult, they've built out about seven uh, islands, uh, artificial islands, out of reefs, shoals, and rocks. They've dredged the area around these, ge these uh, geographic features and now put heavy cargo airplane runways and hangars on these islands. And they've also installed and deployed anti-aircraft and anti-naval missile batteries and systems and so weaponize these islands hundreds of miles from the coast of China that have no lawful basis whatsoever and declare, declare these to be sovereign territory of China with territorial waters, territorial airspace, and thereby requiring other countries to seek permission from China to traverse those waters. In response, the U.S. has been sailing freedom of navigation operations, phonops in the military parlance, uh, either uh, on its own or in conjunction where possible with uh, allied forces from Japan, from Australia, and even from the United Kingdom and from France to demonstrate the uh, Western position, the free world's position, that these are not Chinese sovereign waters or airspace, but remain international waterways and airspace. But my great concern, ladies and gentlemen, is if there's going to be an area where we have a potential kinetic event between China and the U.S., it's because of China's very belligerent activities in this very important waterway uh, in, in Asia. Now, one of the reasons that China has become so self-assured and self-confident and, and aggressive in these diplomatic uh, areas is because it has undertaken an unprecedented military budget expansion over the last 30 years of about 800 percent. And there's no precedent for anything like this in peacetime, which is what China has enjoyed over the last 30 years. And this has given China the means, the, the wealth that it has enjoyed through all of this trade with the U.S., with Europe, and with its Asian allies. And it's directed it and channeled it to a very powerful military with increasingly aggressive operations and ambitions. Now, as I mentioned earlier, China is a landlocked country with relatively secure borders. And yet, just earlier this year, we saw the Chinese military mass on the Indian border engage in a number of incursions along the border at various checkpoints and then assault Indian soldiers 
uh, during April, May, and June. And please remember, ladies and gentlemen, that these two uh, giants of the Asian continent actually had a brief hot war in the early 1960s. And I think the last thing that anyone from a political, geopolitical, and military pers perspective would want to see in Asia today is another hot war between these two colossi of the Asian continent. But more importantly for our purposes right now is what the Chinese military has been doing in the uh, Western Pacific region. And as I mentioned earlier with that Chinese perspective map, seeking to carve out uh, near absolute control over the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the Yellow Sea by uh, being able to enact and implement an anti-access area denial capability with a robust air force and naval power projection capability, where now the Chinese Navy has far more ships than that of the United States, building up its air force capability and now enlarging significantly both its conventional and nuclear arsenals. And I don't believe the idea here is to trigger a kinetic military event with the United States or any other country, save perhaps Taiwan. And again, we can talk about Taiwan in the Q&A. But my own sense is that what the Chinese Communist Party is looking to do is over time to be able to effectively weaken America's commitment to its allies, to Japan, to South Korea, to Taiwan, to those countries in Southeast Asia to whom the U.S. is either legally committed to defend, such as Japan, or is engaged in a number of defense cooperation operations and agreements so that there really is no serious, significant U.S. deterrent capability any longer. And all of the countries in Asia, including some of the world's most powerful economies, must succeed to the geopolitical fact that China is the dominant Asian power and that China will effectively manage Asia's commerce for the foreseeable future. And this is a, an issue of, of course, great concern. And I defer to the experts in the military on a very robust response that the U.S. has been undertaking in conjunction with our allies. But again, an increasingly dangerous part of the world, almost exclusively because of China's very ambitious, aggressive, and occasionally belligerent designs of the last decade to decade and a half. And in conjunction with this strategy, ladies and gentlemen, I specifically tie in the problems that we have had with successive U.S. administrations in dealing with the North Korea nuclear threat. The only reason there's probably still a, a North Korean nuclear threat is because China is the economic lifeline for the North Korean regime, not just Kim Jong-un, but his father and his grandfather. And China ensures that the North Korean regime has foodstuffs, has energy, and has all of the fundamentals for an economy to allow it to survive, even at the most fundamental poverty-stricken levels. I mean, in many ways, North Korea is a gulag writ large in the 21st century, but really to dedicate most of its excess resources to developing a nuclear weapons and ballistic missile delivery capability to threaten the United States, which North Korea has been able to do now for several years, even as it continues to build nuclear bombs, maybe anywhere from 40 to 60 right now, the intelligence really isn't that good in that respect. But the end goal here is to ensure that any U.S. president is working with other countries in Asia, those countries that North Korea directly threatens, especially South Korea and Japan, so that we must go through the Chinese door. The solution to North Korea must always go through Beijing, and China inserts itself uh, as a regional player so that it's always keeping the U.S. off balance. We're distracted from other issues in Asia when North Korea begins to test its nuclear missiles or to threaten allies in the region in other ways. And so I see North Korea as part of a larger strategy in the region to keep the United States off balance in so many critical ways. Now, please do not take this as an exaggerated scenario for any type of Chinese desire for war uh, with its neighbors and allies, I shouldn't say allies, uh, uh, trade partners, given that the Chinese economy is so interdependent with those of its neighbors, including the rogue province of Taiwan, as China sees it, Japan, South Korea, and the uh, tiger economies of Southeast Asia. So uh, the interdependence makes it very, very deleterious to China's economy, to China's society, and to China's infrastructure if there were to be any type of a conflict in the region. But beyond the regional impact would be the impact to the global economy, ladies and gentlemen, because some of the world's most important and valuable supply chains would necessarily be devastated if the number two economy, China, were in a war with the number three economy, Japan, 
the number 11 economy, South Korea, the number 20 economy, Taiwan, and of course, the United States would be obligated to defend Japan. And for that matter, further complicating the situation, Russia, which is the world's 10th or 11th largest economy, borders North Korea and Japan and could also become involved if, her, if its interests were to be threatened. And I close on this part of the geopolitical discussion in Asia, ladies and gentlemen, with the, the primacy of Japan as a U.S. ally. And Japan is often the understated, underassessed, undervalued ally. But this Venn diagram, uh, put together by a think tank here in Washington, D.C., beautifully demonstrates just how critical Japan is as an ally and partner in four of the most important networks for the United States on a global scale. The G7 leading free market democracies, a, a notional T12 of the leading technological partners in the free world, the Quad, which would be formed by India, Japan, uh, Australia, and the United States to help curb China's ambitions in the Indo-Pacific region, and we'll touch on that shortly, and also a D10, and it doesn't have to be 10 countries, but it would be 10 of the world's leading democracies to help advance democratic norms, values, and systems uh, in contra in, uh, to contrast with what China has been looking to do in exporting its authoritarian surveillance model through the BRI program to a number of developing countries worldwide. And so Japan is the one country that partners with the United States in almost all of these strategic alliances and networks. So as we shift from geopolitics to technology, ladies and gentlemen, I will posit that the technological Cold War II, for lack of a better phrase right now, launched by China against the United States and against the free world, came in the form of this Made in China 2025 initiative that was uh, delivered by uh, General Secretary Xi in 2015. And it's very straightforward. China seeks to achieve industrial manufacturing independence and global dominance in the world's 10 to 12 leading advanced uh, breakthrough technologies of the 21st century. And we're looking here at robotics, at genetics, at artificial intelligence, cloud computing, semiconductors, uh, aerospace, bioengineering, food security, energy security, maritime engineering. All of the critical industries and technology sectors that will that are expected to dominate the global economy in the 21st century, China is seeking to dominate itself. Now, that ambition in and of itself is not problematic. The United States, our partners in Germany and other European countries and Asian economies are also looking to have as strong a role in the global economy as possible. But we operate in the West, in the free world, through free, open and competitive marketplaces. That's the whole basis for our membership in the World Trade Organization and the global economy and the underpinnings that we have been uh, describing in the last several minutes. What China is looking to do is an outright violation of the World Trade Organization, which prohibits quotas by governments uh, for leading sectors such as the one that China has laid out here. And it's also involved in m massive subsidies of these industries, and as we'll touch on Huawei in a second, you know, Huawei is the recipient of anywhere from 50 to 70 billion dollars in tax breaks and subsidies direct and indirect from the Chinese government in order to achieve its global dominant status in 4G and 5G technology. And so the Chinese government very openly tipping the scales in favor of its national champions is in contravention of the principles of free trade through which the U.S. and most of our allies around the world operate. And so this is essentially a shot across the bow at America's Silicon Valley and digital technology and semiconductor processing industries, and against Germany's advanced industrial manufacturing sector, as well as related sectors in all of the leading free world economies globally. And as I just mentioned, this is a, a campaign that has raised a great concern and alarm in Washington, D.C., which has put together now a strategy to effectively blacklist Huawei from the telecommunications networks and infrastructure grids of the world's leading economies and also in as many developed countries as possible, essentially because Washington has declared Huawei, ZTE, and other 5G uh, companies uh, in China, and also, and we'll expand on this, other technology companies as essentially dirty companies. And by that, um, th the essence is based on a national security law that was based uh, that was passed by Beijing in 2017 that compels every Chinese state-owned enterprise, private corporation, 
private citizen, private organization, to allow the Chinese Communist Party access to all of its accumulated data. Now, this means that this data can be used for espionage, for sabotage, for blackmail, for a whole host of nefarious purposes. And so using Huawei and other Chinese technology companies effectively exposes your government, your corporations, and your infrastructure and telecommunication systems to influence and control by the Chinese Communist Party. And the U.S. has been effective in uh, promoting an alternative clean network now. This is a major initiative of the current administration over the last several months to promote uh, clean cloud computing, undersea cables from sort of hyperscale espionage by Chinese companies, clean apps and app stores, clean carriers, and clean systems, and effectively branding one operation, one network uh, for the free world, and one that would be dominated by China and whatever small number of countries would come under its increasingly powerful sway. Unfortunately, this may lead eventually to a bifurcated splinternet, as we've come to know it, but it's almost all because of China's policies in the, in the world of digital technology, beginning, of course, with its firewalled internet and its closing off of access to its massive consumer market from a good part of the American and Western technology companies. So this is a policy that began in 2015, and now, just earlier this year, I believe around April or so, China announced the China Standards 2035 strategy. And this comes on top of the Made in China 2025 strategy, where China not only seeks to achieve industrial manufacturing independence and global dominance of the leading technologies of the 21st century, but now under this policy is seeking to set the technical specifications and also the international terms and standards for the usage of all of these technologies. So just as the U.S. and, the, and just as the uh, U.S. and our European allies have worked together to forge a system of terms and standards which render all of these systems interoperable on a worldwide scale to allow for ease of use and flexibility and the like, uh, China is looking to create a parallel system which, we, which would be controlled and dominated by the Chinese Communist Party in ways that, despite the lovely rhetoric about win-win, is really intended to ensure absolute Chinese primacy in all of these areas of the global economy in, in deep into the 21st century. And, of course, on a kinetic level, we're very much concerned that if China is successful in dominating all of these advanced technologies, this could potentially play out in the context of a satellite war, given that China has a pronounced interest in protecting its own infrastructure, in protecting its civilian labor force, and, of course, to ensure as smooth and interoperable a global supply chain that it is able to exploit for its own purposes, so that you may have the possibility of conflict playing out in, among satellites with very advanced anti-satellite weaponry that China has developed in recent years, and that it continues to improve and to sharpen with a specific purpose of destroying American, European, and free world technologies in outer space to effectively render any type of a Western defense impossible. So with all of this information coming to the foreground, ladies and gentlemen, in recent years, you have now in Washington more of a bipartisan consensus that China is a, a very problematic actor on the world stage. And China had a much more benign uh, public uh, reputation uh, and stature uh, just until about five, maybe seven years ago. And again, I, I have to put most of this on General Secretary Xi because prior to his ascension to power, China simply wasn't viewed this way, even where many of its activities were moving in this direction anyway. So whether we have a re-elected incumbent in Washington in January in the White House or we have a brand new administration, my own sense is that you'll see a growing consensus of Republicans and Democrats coming together to forge new strategies for dealing with this China threat across a, a spectrum of operations, industries and sectors. And part of the driving force here will be the human rights uh, component. And frankly, uh, we in the U.S. and many of our uh, allies in Europe and in Asia have sidelined the issue of human rights, which is really part of a, a monstrous regime in China that's really coming to light in recent years 
given what is a near ethnic genocide and cultural genocide of the Muslim Uyghur population by Beijing in uh, Xinjiang province in western China, the renewed repression of the Buddhist Tibetans in southwest China, new repressive measures against the Mongolian minority in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, all against the backdrop of China's brutal repression of democracy and the right to dissent in what was an autonomous Hong Kong, uh, increasing threats and amphibious uh, invasion exercises that are targeting Taiwan, and, of course, China's own brutal suppression of the political freedoms of 1.4 billion Chinese citizens who are living under an increasingly repressive authoritarian surveillance state far beyond the imagination of George Orwell in 1984. So I think you'll, you're beginning to see already, ladies and gentlemen, the beginning of an international movement to target Beijing's Winter Olympics in February of 2022, given these egregious human rights violations and China's expanded violations of international law and international trade agreements, so that you'll have many of these NGOs calling on governments to boycott the Beijing Olympics and perhaps even the IOC to uh, revoke and to rebid the Olympic Games. And if this really takes fruition in the next several weeks or in early 2021, expect a very significant and vociferous Chinese backlash across all fronts. So as we shift now from China to some of the other geopolitical uh, challenges we face, ladies and gentlemen, one thing that we've come to realize uh, under the COVID lockdowns is just how vulnerable and exposed the American economy and that of so many countries in the free world have been to China's uh, inordinate dominance of global supply chains. And credit goes to China. For the last 20 years, it has exploited every opportunity, especially with WTO membership, to be able to build a, a spectacular factory floor, or factory floors, I should say, across China, uh, very skilled labor force and uh, a very uh, impressive logistics base, and, of course, geographic proximity to other valuable uh, components of the supply chain in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea, and in Southeast Asia. But there's obviously going to be a very significant shift away from these supply chain dependencies as it pertains to national defense, military hardware and weapon systems, and, of course, medical equipment and health supplies away from China to other parts of the world, ideally to reshore those critical national security sectors in terms of the supply chain, either back to the continental United States or the United States proper, uh, or to nearshore them to Canada, Mexico, or other countries in the Western Hemisphere. But where that's not possible, I think you'll see a reshoring to other countries in Asia. And Vietnam has already been a major player in looking to attract multinational supply chain systems out of China, largely because of competitive wages, very impressive labor force, though nowhere near as large as uh, that of China. We're seeing similar moves by Indonesia in recent years, but I think the country to watch in the coming years is going to be India. India has a population of about 1.3 billion people. It's the world's largest democracy, and uh, it uh, adopted a British legal and administrative code when it won its independence in the 1940s. But unfortunately, India remains a very, very poor country, and it just reached the per capita GDP level of Bangladesh. Uh, so India still has a very long way to go to build out its economy and to welcome foreign direct investment. And in many ways, economically and productivity-wise, it's today where China was in the mid-1990s. So if one thinks of the explosive growth of China over the last 25 years, one can see something along those lines potentially replicated in India if they take the right steps to liberalize their economy, to promote legal and social reforms, and to genuinely welcome foreign direct investment in a way that can help transform this massive economy where, by 2040, perhaps one out of every five working men and women in the world will be the citizens of India. So the United States is working very closely now with um, India, embodied here by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And we are looking to build not only a very strong economic partnership, but to take it beyond the economics and look at uh, India as a geopolitical partner in the Indo-Pacific region. And I emphasize partner, ladies and gentlemen, because India is the inheritor of a grand civilization that dates back 4,000 years plus. 
and will never allow itself to become a junior ally of the United States in some type of a formal alliance. But a strategic partnership is potentially there for the offing. And if you look at this map here, you see that India sits directly north of perhaps the most important single waterway in the world, and that is the Indian Ocean, the maritime superhighway that connects Asian markets to Middle Eastern energy supplies, to the natural resources of the African continent, to very affluent consumer markets in Europe. And China's increased military ambitions, not only in the Western Pacific, but in the Indian Ocean, are of great concern to India. And as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the potential for a quad alliance or quad network of India, Australia, and Japan working with the United States to help check and contain very ambitious uh, Chinese military activity that could be a direct threat to India's own uh, national security interests and to its own sphere of influence throughout the Indian Ocean. Now, this maritime superhighway I described also, as I mentioned, helps deliver energy in the form of oil and natural gas from the Middle East to major markets in Asia and to Europe. And we see from this map, ladies and gentlemen, that three of the world's most valuable and important choke points are all surrounding the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula. It's very important to understand why this remains so important today, even though the United States has largely weaned itself from the region energy-wise. And this graphic here gives you a sense of just how abundant the oil and natural gas reserves still are in this part of the world. And we may not be dependent on the region for energy anymore, but our allies in Asia and Europe still remain inordinate, inordinately dependent on the Middle East for oil and natural gas, which is why in looking to support our allies and to support these underpinnings of the global economy, it's still a great responsibility of the United States to deal with the radical Shia theocracy that is the Islamic Republic of Iran. And here we have a photo of the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. And uh, he remains uh, the implacable leader of a country that, by U.S. standards and those of our European allies, is still the world's leading state sponsor of, of uh, international terrorism. Iran has been working actively through proxies and directly to uh, further destabilize countries in the Middle East, not only in Syria and Iraq, but also Yemen, Bahrain, Lebanon, and uh, Gaza and uh, continues to develop a nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capability that can threaten and potentially extort U.S. allies and assets in South Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, and also in Europe. And so this remains a key concern of the United States and our allies going forward. And as long as this uh, theocratic regime rules in Tehran, I believe we'll have these intractable problems in this part of the world. And it's one of the reasons why the United States continues to place most of its Middle Eastern strategy in a Sunni Arab coalition that often is led by Saudi Arabia, here embodied by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and looking to see how we work with these countries to diversify their economies away from fossil fuels, but also, very importantly, to modernize their economies to promote legal and social reforms so that they become more active and more constructive partners in the region and in the global economy worldwide. And we also see major diplomatic breakthroughs as a result of these reforms in the ongoing list of Arab countries that are now willing to engage in full diplomatic relations and exchanges with the state of Israel. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the United States energy resilience and oil and natural gas coming from the technological innovation of hydraulic fracturing and the shale revolution has given us far greater flexibility to deal with creative and innovative approaches to once intractable problems in the Middle East. And this also gives us operational flexibility in Venezuela, which ironically is one of the most oil-rich countries in the world, but because of failed socialist dictatorial policies has become a near-failed state in Latin America. Now, I want to look at Venezuela, ladies and gentlemen, from a geopolitical perspective, if I might. Uh, first of all, there is a very concerning relationship between Caracas and Moscow, where uh, Russia sent, has sent on several occasions now military cargo planes filled with hundreds of Russian soldiers that have beefed up the Venezuelan military forces to keep the dictator Maduro in power all of these years against outcries and street prote protests calling for his removal. 
So we're concerned about Chinese military operations in Venezuela. We're concerned about Venezuela's current debt to China of about $15 billion. It had once reached $50 billion, which Venezuela had loaned from China. Now that it's down to $15 billion, it's being repaid in an oil for loan program. But the concern that we have is that if Venezuela's economy continues to falter and it's unable to produce the oil and to ship it to China, that we may have Chinese companies looking to seize sovereign assets in Venezuela, effectively establishing physical beachheads of the Chinese Communist Party in Latin America. And then there's Iran, which has long enjoyed a healthy relationship with um, Maduro. And we have Iran running uh, its operatives in Venezuela with uh, um, drug trafficking and money laundering operations that provide hard needed cash for Iran that's suffering from U.S. led international sanctions and also provides important resources to, again, help keep Maduro in power. So Russia, China, and Iran all operating in this governance vacuum that is Venezuela today. And of course, there is also a humanitarian concern on the part of the United States, given the fact that in this country of nearly 30 million people, almost a tenth of the population has already fled, given the destitution that uh, the citizens of Venezuela face. But what were to happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you actually do have an outright collapse of the Venezuelan government, and you have a complete failure to govern and a complete crisis of society, and you have major migrant outflows of millions of people, and say as little as a half a million to a million Venezuelans streaming up Central America towards the Texas border. And then you have a major humanitarian crisis for the U.S. and Mexico to deal with. And we're already very much concerned about the problems that we see in Mexico, which is one of our best friends, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but on an international basis. But unfortunately, Mexico continues to be beset by the very violent and vicious and brutal uh, narco-trafficking wars between the various cartels. For the most part, these seem to be contained within um, Mexico. But the problem, of course, that we face is a societal responsibility in that these narco-traffickers are operating with great, great profit motives because they're feeding a massive demand for drugs by the American people. And I'm speaking to a largely San Diego audience here, of course. You know these issues better than most of us in other parts of the United States. So we're working as closely as we can with Mexican authorities to improve economic conditions. The USMCA trade agreement can go a long way in that direction. But to help train the military and to provide for anti-corruption measures that will diminish the impact of these uh, cartels in Mexico and in the United States. So now I'm going to begin to close, ladies and gentlemen, by going back to the Eastern Hemisphere and looking at some of the major concerns we have with Russia, Africa, and Europe. And I will posit, ladies and gentlemen, that despite all of the attention that Russia has received for its political uh, interference and destabilizing activities, not only in U.S. elections, but those in Europe and other democracies around the world, that dealing with Russia in a very straightforward and hard-headed manner is an absolute necessity given the geopolitical scale of Russia's operations worldwide. Uh, Russia, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sits on one-eighth of the world's landmass. It spans 11 time zones. And as you can see from this inverted map of Russia looking south, uh, Russia is able to project uh, power and to conduct malign political activities in East Asia, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, and the Black Sea and Caucasus regions, and for our purposes here in this discussion, in Europe as well. And I want to start out, first of all, with Russia's energy strategy towards Europe, ladies and gentlemen, in which it continues to play a dominant role in providing oil and natural gas because Russia is such a natural resource-rich country. It produces almost nothing of value except vodka and caviar for export, but it does ship out its natural resources in the form of oil, natural gas, diamonds, and other valuable minerals, and, of course, valuable uh, stores of timber uh, to world markets. But for our purposes here, I want to look at the uh, large oil and natural gas reserves that are believed to lie beneath the Arctic seabed. And Russia's absolute determination to extract these oil and natural gas reserves to maintain their market share on global energy markets, and also to ensure continued dominance of the supply lines of oil and natural gas to European markets, especially Germany, with a now controversial Nord Stream 2 project 
that's caused great concern in Washington and unfortunately led to new tensions in U.S.-Germany relations because Germany doesn't want the United States to withdraw any more troops and forces from Germany, now down from about 36,000 to about 27,000, while it continues to increase its absolute dependence on Russia for energy and therefore for its economic survival. And so we're looking to understand how these two contradicting objectives uh, fuse together in German policy. At the same time that a number of uh, other European countries will also be increasingly dependent on Russian oil and natural gas, other countries such as Poland and the Baltic countries and NATO members in southeastern Europe are looking to build new energy ties to the United States and, frankly, to other energy exporters to look to see how they wean uh, from their dependency on Russian energy in the years to come. So we have here within the European Union and within NATO an energy divide, ladies and gentlemen, that is causing unnecessary and unwelcome stresses in the European continent. Similarly, we have a security divide inside of Europe between those countries that either border or are proximate to Russia, especially the Baltic countries and many countries in Eastern Europe that endured Soviet communist domination for a half century um, uh, from the 1940s until the 1990s uh, versus those countries in Central and Western Europe, such as Germany, France and Spain, that are more sanguine about Russian military activities. Of course, they're not as immediately exposed to the kinds of operations that Russia has conducted in annexing Crimea and invading and still occupying Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, there are still kinetic operations in eastern Ukraine. They're just not covered by the Western media very much anymore. There's also a significant Russian troop presence in Moldova next to Romania, and there's continued skirmishes along the borders of the Baltics and Russian military operations in the Baltic Sea and in Kaliningrad, which is so uh, sovereign Russian territory between Lithuania and Poland. So now we see also a security divide or an insecurity divide developing among EU and NATO partners. And then there's China's presence in Europe through the former 16 plus one, now that Italy has joined the 17 plus one BRI network of countries that have very uh, openly welcomed Chinese investment and infrastructure project construction in many countries in Eastern and Central Europe, largely poorer countries that are looking to expedite and accelerate their economic development. But there are certain problems here, ladies and gentlemen, that many of the original projects that were built were not in compliance with European standards and were often uh, let in no-bid competitive or, or non-competitive um, bidding processes in ways that were causing great consternation among technocrats and leading officials in Brussels. And so we have this additional divide as to whether or not countries in Eastern Europe will always abide by European business standards or will sometimes leave those by the wayside in order to achieve more favorable terms for Chinese infrastructure projects. So we, we have these various stresses inside the European Union, but I want to remind everyone that Europe has been fortunate and it was largely insulated from much of the chaos in Northern Africa, especially of the 20th century, because these countries were mostly ruled by dictatorships. Well, all of this was undone in the Arab revolts of 20, 2009, 2010, 2011. Some would call it the Arab Spring, but there really has been very little springtime in most of these countries as a result of those revolts. But uh, Europe's history has been inextricably, inextricably linked with that of Africa for centuries, ladies and gentlemen, dating back to the Greco-Roman period and the Mediterranean Sea essentially as the unifying basin between Europe and Africa. And what is happening now with the end of the Ottoman Empire in the 19-teens and 1920s, and now with the Arab revolts and a reawakening and, and an interconnectedness of the populations in these countries with those of freer societies around the world, is a desire to link up with Europe from a number of African countries for a whole host of reasons. But I think that Europe is going to have to understand that it needs to integrate a more cohesive African strategy into European Union and NATO policies going forward. And let me offer one perspective as to how this plays out, ladies and gentlemen. Now, candidly, this graphic it represents a pre-COVID growth uh, pattern in Africa as well as other continents. 
But you see here that pre-COVID, about a dozen countries in Africa were enjoying tremendous growth prospects deep into this decade. Uh, four, six, eight percent growth rates were expected. And a lot of this is due to mobile technology that now places interconnectivity into the hands of African entrepreneurs who are otherwise living and having to survive in very corrupt regimes, dictatorships, sheikdoms, and the like, and now are able to directly access global markets and offer their products and services directly to a global economy. Well, much of this has been disrupted, of course, as have other parts of the global economy by COVID. But you have here tremendous investment opportunities in Africa in the years and decades to come. So a continent that's been beset by famine, by devastation, and by war offers great potential promise in the 21st century. But there is still one great challenge that Africa and African nations have not quite dealt with, and that is what is projected to be a population explosion. Now, today, the uh, total population of Africa is a little over a billion people, but that could double in as little as 25 years. And what does one do if one is running a, a government, one is running a country where there is a population explosion that exceeds uh, productivity and GDP growth and the enlargement of the economy? Well, one can expect many of those citizens to leave that country and go where there is economic opportunity and a far better quality of life. Well, the human trafficking pipelines are currently in place, ladies and gentlemen, and they have been for a number of years from sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel en route to Europe. And uh, barring the crisis that we saw in 2015, where almost 3 million people entered Europe, and about 1.5 million of those were from African countries, the rest were from the Middle East and South Asia, right now that number has diminished significantly. So there's maybe about 100 to 150,000 Africans that are making their way to Europe every year. But in the event of a crisis, or perhaps if, say, COVID so profoundly disrupts a number of uh, largely populated countries that you have a massive, unchecked, surprise migration flow into Europe, Europe really hasn't put together an EU-wide strategy for dealing with this potential uh, challenge coming from a number of African countries. And compounding all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is as we see in the United States currently, with an increased polarization of our political parties, we see in many EU countries now a polarization of their domestic politics. So we see a significant increase in sort of far-right nativist parties and also far-left radical environmental sort of climate-focused parties that are pulling apart the center and, and the social and political fabric in, in European societies, as we've seen happen in many parts of the United States, especially under the COVID pandemic and these attendant lockdowns. So the United States will be working with our partners in the two most important countries in the European Union going forward. And here I'm speaking largely about a post-Brexit EU, because I believe whether it's a re-elected incumbent or a new administration, we will have a very important relationship with the United Kingdom, even if Vice President Biden has threatened that in certain ways, depending on the outcome of the Brexit talks. But Washington will be working with Brussels, but also with Berlin and with Paris. And we'll be entering a very new period in uh, Europe in 2021, the first time in 16 years that Germany will not have been led by uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. So a new era in German politics, which means new economic leadership for the European Union. And post-Brexit, we now have in France the only nuclear power in the European Union and the, that is with nuclear weapons and the only country that has the capacity and the willingness to project power in the European Union far from its shores in the Mediterranean, in Northern Africa, and as I mentioned before, with freedom of navigation operations with the United States in the South China Sea. So, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my presentation here. Uh, I hope this has been a somewhat insightful and illuminating presentation of the geopolitical challenges that, again, either a second-term President Trump or a first-term President Biden will face in this situation room in the White House and looking to work with our national security leaders and our allies and partners around the world to craft the most effective global strategies for dealing with this constellation of geopolitical risk challenges. I thank you very much, and I look forward to the Q&A session. We have our first question. Huawei has become both the market leader and a technologically superior supplier to the 5G marketplace around the world. 
Given the subsidies provided by China, how can other companies effectively compete with them? An excellent question, and one for which uh, there is not yet a clear and definitive solution, and one in which Washington is grappling with our allies in the free world, but especially with those countries that already have sort of leading national champions in the space of 5G. So here we're looking uh, primarily at uh, Sweden, which has Ericsson, uh, Finland, which has uh, Nokia, and of course, South Korea with Samsung. And the U.S. could have been a more active player in this field, but in the context of Huawei's rise to global dominance, uh, there's a very good sense that it defeated Cisco Technologies through illicit means, uh, especially IP theft, and also probably led to the destruction of Nortel Technologies 15 years ago. And so Huawei's very deceptive practices, IP theft and the Chinese Communist Party's policies of forced technology transfers for any countries that do business in China, have rendered us in a very vulnerable situation. One of the uh, uh, initiatives that's being considered right now is a possible international consortium that brings together perhaps Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, and perhaps Cisco to form a new consortium that advances 5G technologies. There are also initiatives coming from China that promote a more free market approach rather than one that is dominated by governments. But there really is no one solution right now to Huawei. Uh, this is going to take a long time to implement anyway. I mean, there's a lot of promotional information and activity out there as if 5G is arriving tomorrow, and it's not. The installation of the hardware and software systems will take many years to be fully implemented worldwide. And so that's why one of the first things that we can do is to ensure that Huawei has as little access into infrastructure grids and telecommunications networks as possible. And almost every country in the NATO alliance is now part of this uh, transatlantic clean network. And so Huawei will not be installed in any of those countries. We have other countries such as Australia and New Zealand. And Japan needs to be very careful here, ladies and gentlemen. It probably will not single out Huawei for black blacklisting purposes because it has to balance a very important economic relationship with China, and also because of the geopolitical concerns between the two countries in the East Asia Sea. But you, what you will see in many countries is effectively blacklisting Huawei, but not doing so by name, but putting such onerous security and high-risk conditions on any 5G implementation contracts that Huawei won't be able to compete, and look to see if the free market is able to devise a viable alternative to what is now a, a very odious Chinese 5G network that has advanced far beyond where anyone would have wanted it to achieve uh, by now. But it's never too late, and the question will remain, how do we resolve this? There really is no single answer yet, and we'll look to see how governments work together and the free market system works together to be able to achieve a viable competitor, perhaps in the next 12 to 24 months. Our next question, realizing how integral China is to the geopolitical landscape and globalization, is there a future that doesn't include their trade, natural resources, technology, et cetera? If so, and India is the answer, can they ramp up quickly enough to potentially fill that void? All right, so a two-part question, and thank you for that. Uh, the first part, it's very difficult to imagine today a global economy that excludes China in any serious manner. China is the world's number two economy. It may uh, eventually overtake the United States, again, in nominal GDP terms. And its supply chains have been so valuable for so many companies around the world. It's very difficult to see, at least in the short term, how any of these major companies and major economies unwind themselves from China. Now, China is not an especially natural resource-rich country. so. We don't need to be concerned there. But from a trade perspective, uh, the issue is going to be not so much how we unwind trade. I think China will continue to be a very important trade partner. Uh, we will want many companies to be able to access the Chinese consumer market of 1.3 billion people, about 300 million of which are relatively affluent middle class consumers. And we look to see those numbers grow in the years and decades to come. But I think what we want to be able to do is to persuade the Chinese Communist Party that the policies it's undertaken are going to increasingly isolate it 
diplomatically and will make it, if it won't make it a poorer country, it will slow down its growth to such a degree that you may have sort of bottom up social unrest in China that threatens the rule of the party. So we want China to engage in more reciprocal trade and economic ties with the United States, with countries around the world, so that we're all being able to better share in some level of prosperity that China has denied the West in terms of market access to China in recent years, really the last 20 years, and also to be able to elevate the remaining uh, Chinese population to a standard that is also very beneficial for American exporters, for European exports. Again, it's not simply a matter of free trade. It has to be a matter of fair trade. And China has engaged in very, uh, for lack of a better word, selfish, uh, non-win-win, one-sided, uh, mercantilist economic trade policies that have only given us cheaper consumer products, but have hollowed out our economy, hollowed out our labor force and that of our allies. And so there needs to be a reordering of China's economic and trade relationships with the world. And that is a grand strategy that the U.S. cannot undertake unilaterally, but we really need to work with our free world partners um, uh, in this. As it pertains to India, I touched on some of the problems in the initial presentation that India faces. It certainly has the potential to achieve regional and even global power status, both economically and perhaps even militarily. But it still needs to undergo a very profound series of reforms. And there was a sense of anticipation when the current prime minister was elected in 2015, I believe it was, uh, because he campaigned as a liberalizer, as a reformer. But he's also the head of one of the more nationalist parties in India. And many of his reforms have been held back by domestic concerns. There are now, in many ways, worse tensions between the Hindu majority and the Muslim minority which is a minority in India, but is the second largest Muslim population in the world, uh, second to that only of Indonesia. So India has a very long way to go, but I believe that much of what it's come to realize as a result of the COVID pandemic, its own vulnerabilities to China's supply, uh, supply chain dominance, its desire to protect its interests in the Indo-Pacific region. And now look at what's happened between China and India with these skirmishes along the Himalayan border. India now realizes that China is potentially an existential threat in ways that China never manifested in decades past, certainly not since the 1960s war. So I think you'll see a more active partner in India, but again, not in any way that renders it a secondary or junior partner to the United States or to any other country. The potential is certainly there, though, and I think we'll see administrations, Democratic and Republican, working more assiduously with New Delhi to help move it in that direction. Our next question, does China drive their historical view of a right to primacy in the world in their education system? How is this view promulgated within their population? It's an excellent question. Uh, it's a very well-informed audience here, obviously. Uh, one of the concerns that we've had about China in recent years is a very concerted uh, drive to accelerate uh, profound nationalism, almost hostile nationalism, on the part of a larger part of the population in China against its Asian neighbors and especially against the United States. And this takes place both in the Chinese education system, in Chinese media, both traditional media and social media, but especially through Chinese Communist Party directives, where there is a constant drumbeat of anti-American invective, anti-Japanese invective, anti-Korean invective, and a sense that China has suffered at the hands of the world through a quote-unquote century of humiliation, as opposed to, as I described, uh, what I described earlier, is not necessarily the natural growth, but the, the growth of the West uh, because of political, economic, and technological changes in the West that diminished the size of the Chinese economy relative to that of the world economy. China simply went in a different direction, and they can't blame any outside parties, but it's easy to do so to uh, figuratively lick one's wounds for this century of humiliation. And now they're looking to bounce back with a vengeance. And we see this also in the context of wolf warrior diplomacy, which really has caused very aggravated relations with uh, China's European and Asian uh, par trade partners, very aggressive, very hostile, 
uh, very humiliating type uh, diplomatic invective against trade partners filled with threats, filled with outright epithets in ways that one does not expect of the second largest economy in the world and one that one would assume would be more self-assured and self-confident. But we do see much of this being driven by education policies and social policies inside of China in ways that are going to make China an increasingly difficult partner to work with in any capacity, even if there's a pulling back of this kind of belligerent or hostile activity on the diplomatic or foreign policy uh, landscape by the Chinese Communist Party. Simply, as Henry Kissinger once put, once put it, if the Chinese people come to realize that they don't need the outside world anymore, they will become an increasingly difficult country to contend with. And uh, this isn't being assisted by the kind of hard, hostile, nationalist education that has been the underpinning of Chinese society in recent decades. The next question, is China likely to retaliate against U.S. semiconductor companies to counter the U.S. ban on Huawei, ZTE, et cetera? What could be the effect of such a ban? Well, China has sought to undertake tit-for-tat policies when it comes to tariffs, when it comes to bans, when it comes to blacklisting, to the extent possible. But China is still extraordinarily dependent not only on Qualcomm, but on the larger U.S. semiconductor industry and so many aspects of Silicon Valley and the technology industry that continues to be dominated by the United States. And so they have to be very careful about punitive measures that they might take against trade partners that continue to impress upon Washington the need to balance geopolitical objectives and the tactics for achieving those objectives while ensuring that we don't uh, uh, on inadvertently harm our most valuable companies from Qualcomm on down. But the one concern that we have strategically is not so much tit-for-tat policies of tariffs and bans and market access uh, denial, but that in many ways this may in fact accelerate China's subsidies for research and development so that Huawei becomes completely independent per the Made in China 2025 strategy that I laid out earlier so that Huawei was looking to become eventually independent, and it may simply accelerate that timeline. But if that's the case, then I'm not sure there's much blame to be had on U.S. or Western policies, because this has been an open, openly stated policy of Beijing for the last five years. They have always intended to achieve dominance, and whether it was through access to technology, whether it was through forced technology transfers, whether it was through open IP theft, uh, Qualcomm and other similar companies have been in the crosshairs of the Chinese Communist Party for many years. One might argue it's only a matter of time before they achieve that, or at least continue to strive to achieve that level. I'm confident in the ability of our companies to always stay a step ahead, whether it's of Huawei, of other Chinese companies, or for that matter, companies in other parts of the world. But this is going to become a more ruthless and more heated competition, perhaps, because of the state of the uh, tariff wars and the trade wars between the U.S. and China. The next question, given recent volatility between India and China along the Himalayan border, what will the impact be for the U.S., militarily speaking, and for the geopolitical environment? Well, we begin to see the outline of this, and as I described earlier, in this quadrilateral network of like-minded countries that are very much concerned about, again, not China's rise, but the manner in which China conducts its military operations very belligerently and in outright, in outright hostile fashion. I mean, I didn't elaborate in the South China Sea how the Chinese Navy has earlier this year sunk a, a Vietnamese fishing boat. It's harassing fishing boats and other vessels in Malaysian waters and in Indonesian waters, and is constantly threatening its neighbors in very intimidating fashion. And the fact that the Chinese state-owned enterprise has seized the sovereign uh, port in Sri Lanka, which is immediately adjacent to India, and also how the Chinese Belt Road Initiative is looking to construct ports and maritime facilities in Bangladesh and Pakistan and throughout the, uh, the Indian Ocean in what we call the String of Pearls, all causes great concern in India that it's, it's literally being surrounded by strategic Chinese assets 
in ways that could be very deleterious to India's own freedom of operation, freedom of commerce, and freedom to protect the nation and its interests throughout the, uh, the Indian Ocean. So I believe that India wants to proceed very carefully over here. There is, just as we just talked about, a very pronounced national element inside of Chinese society. There is a very pronounced nationalist element inside of India society. And India has to be very careful how it proceeds in its partnership with the United States especially, because there are still significant segments of India that are socialist and see the U.S. as the leader of a capitalist wing of the global economy, and also with countries such as Japan and Australia, so that India is never seen as a country of secondary or tertiary importance in the region or on the world stage. But we are looking to see how we can increase uh, military training and exercises, hardware sales to India, which also remains very much a loyal customer of Russia in terms of weapons and hardware systems. And again, this goes back to India looking to see how it balances its interest and its geopolitical posture so it's never seen as the junior partner of any one particular country. But I'm very confident there's going to be an accelerated uh, partnership between the U.S. and India across multiple fronts. And I'll offer one more example on the technology front. After these uh, skirmishes on the China-Indian border, one of the ways that India looked to retaliate against China is they banned 59 Chinese apps, including TikTok, including uh, Huawei, I mean, not Huawei, a uh, WeChat. And of course, India has a vast consumer market of 1.3 billion consumers, potentially, that China was looking to penetrate to build out its own um, uh, 5G and advanced technology systems and profits, for that matter. And now the Indian market, at least for the time being, is utterly closed off to all of these Chinese app and software companies. So India is taking independent measures and will look to see where it can align its interests with those of partners in Asia and around the world to achieve that, that ambition of checking China's activities that are hostile to India directly and indirectly. I believe we have time for just one more question. Recently, China has claimed that they are an Arctic-adjacent nation. What are implications of this? Building and occupying artificial reefs to claim territory? I'm not aware of any such plans yet, although one never knows with China. Now, very importantly, geographically, China is not an Arctic nation. The Arctic Council is comprised of less than a dozen countries, and it's only those countries that actually have territory within the Arctic Circle. And China is not one of those. But what China is doing is it's engaging in joint projects, collaborating with Russia on some major liquefied natural gas and possibly oil exploration projects in Russia's Arctic region in Siberia, and also potentially partnering in the protection of these new shipping lanes along the northern sea route. And by asserting that it has national interests in the Arctic region, is insisting it has a seat in this Arctic Council and in shaping any type of international strategy regarding the exploitation of a whole uh, series of resources, not just oil and natural gas, but also vast fisheries to be exploited in the Arctic region. And may I add, that's also an area of great concern, because just recently, hundreds of Chinese ships were found illegally fishing in the waters of the Galapagos Islands and all along South America's western coast, very much uh, damaging the well-regulated fisheries of those coastal countries in South America. So many of these Chinese companies operate in complete contravention of international law and agreements. And we're not aware of any Chinese plans to do anything along these lines yet, building artificial islands in the Arctic region. The very, very challenging physical and natural environment there may make that a very difficult objective to accomplish, but they may not need to do so as long as they're in a tactical alliance with Russia, and Russia has fortified several dozen air and naval facilities to protect Russia's interests and, in effect, protecting China's interests in providing for time-sensitive supply chain management along these new shipping routes. That concludes the question and answer section. Well, great. Um, first of all, John, thank you very much for a very insightful and engaging presentation. You certainly delivered, even though we had to do this remotely, so thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our attendees on behalf of the Cyber Center of Excellence, 
Navlor, and our great sponsor, Qualcomm. We'd like you guys to be aware that this presentation will be available in the coming days on the Cyber Center of Excellence website, along with John's contact information. And we really encourage you to share access to this presentation with your colleagues at work, LinkedIn networks, et cetera. Um, on behalf of everybody, we'd like to adjourn, wishing you all a uh, safe and happy National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.